Welcome, and thanks for joining us. I'm Linda Bell, Editorial Director at Tech Briefs Media Group, and I'll be your moderator for today's webcast, High Performance Thermal Management Solutions, Pump Two-Phase Cooling and Loop Thermosiphons, sponsored by Advanced Cooling Technologies. Today's webcast will last about 30 minutes, and there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. You can submit a question anytime by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. Our presenter will answer as many questions as possible, and those not answered during the live event will be answered following the webinar. In order to view the presentation properly, please disable any pop-up blockers you might have on your browser. So now let's meet our speakers. Pete Ritt is Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Advanced Cooling Technologies. He joined ACT in 2010 to head the technical services business moving to VP of Sales and Marketing in 2016. Throughout his career, Pete has successfully managed numerous new technology projects in a variety of industries. He is a former RCA executive where he was responsible for developing technologies and products for commercialization. And joining Pete for the Q&A will be Devin Pellicone, the lead engineer of custom projects at ACT. He has over eight years of experience developing advanced thermal solutions for a wide range of aerospace, military, and commercial applications. Devin has extensive experience developing both active and passive solutions for challenging electronics cooling applications with a particular expertise in evaporative solutions. So now I'd like to hand the program over to Pete Ripp. Pete? Thank you, Linda. I'm Pete Ritt, along with Devin Pellico, and we are delighted to be with you today. In today's webinar, we'd like to explore two new and emerging thermal management solutions, pump two-phase cooling and loop thermosiphons, that are finding application in today's power-hungry but footprint-stingy devices. Today's product designers are seeking more space-efficient thermal solution, and both of these technologies offer that, principally through the use of two-phase heat transfer. In today's webinar, we'll explain the principles of each of these technologies, provide some examples, and offer some guidelines when they may best be utilized. At the end, we'll take some questions from the audience. For the past few decades, excellent thermal management solutions have been attained by using well-established technologies such as air cooling and pumped liquid systems. However, Several emerging thermal management applications have such demanding space and power requirements that neither an air-cooled or pump liquid system may be a viable solution. Some of these applications are pictured here. IGBTs, wind turbines, data center cooling, hybrid battery packs, and new high-powered lasers, to name a few. In some projected applications, heat fluxes upwards of 1,000 watts per centimeter squared are predicted. Therefore, there is an increasing need for a compact, high heat flux thermal management solution. Both pump two-phase cooling and loop thermosiphon offer such a need. There are at least two major markets, power electronics and laser arrays, that are showing increased demand for these types of high-performance thermal management solutions and both of them are experiencing the same trends. Packaging sizes are not keeping up with power requirements. Thermal requirements is frequently not a major consideration when these de design decisions are made, and it can be disastrous for device performance and life. When faced with thermal design, a common pitfall is to use conventional air-cooled or water-cooled solutions that fit in the existing space. Sometimes this works, but increasingly these solutions are falling short of the necessary thermal performance. Fortunately, there are some good options to address these needs, and we'll explore two of them today, pump two-phase cooling and loop thermosiphons. Let's start with pump two-phase cooling. As its name suggests, pump two-phase cooling is an active pump solution that intentionally uses phase transitions from liquid to vapor to remove waste heat. As we will show, 
The technology offers many inherent advantages over single-phase liquid cooling, including reduced flow rates, power consumption, with increased heat dissipation capability. Let's review some of the basic principles of pump two-phase cooling. P2P uses the same core components as a traditional single-phase pump liquid system. It has a pump, an evaporator, a heat exchanger, and a working fluid reservoir. A key difference between pump single-phase and pump two-phase cooling is that the working fluid is close to its saturation temperature as it comes in contact with the hot device. The heat causes the working fluid to evaporate, and heat is removed through latent heat of vaporization, which, as we will see, has some very attractive benefits. To explain a little bit more about pump two-phase cooling, here is a clip from our, uh, here a video from our website and YouTube channel. Go ahead with the video. Pump two-phase, or evaporative cooling systems, use the same basic system-level components as the pump single-phase system. However, pumped two-phase systems typically use refrigerants as the working fluid. Through refrigerant selection and appropriate controls, the refrigerant is designed to boil as it acquires heat from the hot surface of the device. More heat can be removed through the boiling process, otherwise known as latent heat, than through sensible heat with single-phase cooling. Boiling across the entire evaporator surface offers a further advantage in that the evaporator will have a very uniform surface temperature, typically within a few degrees. As you'll see in some of the examples, the thermal transfer power of boiling of the working fluid as it moves along the evaporator can be quite advantageous and provide benefits in system efficiency and size. Here's a visual demonstration of pump two-phase cooling. The inlet on the left contains only liquid. As the working fluid passes along the heat source, vapor bubbles are formed. Exiting is a combination of liquid and vapor. Let's go ahead with the video. In this video, a thermal load is applied across the plate. As the fluid travels, it begins to boil. The boiling process removes the thermal energy from the component and carries it to the end of the plate. At the exit point, the working fluid is 50% liquid and 50% vapor. We think that's a great visual of pump two-phase cooling in action. To give a clearer sense of the flow rate and pumping power differences between pump liquid and pump two-phase systems, the following comparison is provided for an avionics application. In order to dissipate 80 kilowatts of heat, a pump liquid system using PAO as the working fluid would require a flow rate of 35 gallons per minute and approximately 5.3 kilowatts of power. A pump two-phase system using R245FA would require only six gallons a minute and 250 watts of power, which is an 80% reduction in flow rate requirements and a 95% reduction in power requirements compared to a pump liquid system. A significant difference for sure. Now let's turn it back to Linda for a polling question. Okay, thanks, Pete. So our first polling question to our audience, what is the single most important criteria your company uses when deciding on thermal management solutions? Is it A, cost, B, performance, or C, reliability? And uh, we'll give a couple seconds for you all to um, submit your answers, and then uh, we'll send back to Pete. Thank you, Linda. Here are some real-world examples where pump two-phase cooling is being used. The first is high heat flux laser cooling. In this application, the high heat fluxes must be dissipated while maintaining tight temperature limits across the diode surface. We'll look at that in a little more detail in an upcoming slide. Another example is cooling a parallel electronics board for a pulse directed energy weapon application which have both stringent isothermal requirements and size and weight constraints for better mobility. Finally, there is a power electronics example 
where high operational reliability of the electronics is required. In these applications, there is concern about water leaking. In addition, the ability to efficiently move waste heat away from an environmentally controlled room is another key thermal management benefit of pump two-phase cooling. We have demonstrated that pump two-phase offers the benefits of reduced pumping power and flow rates. If one can maintain uniform boiling across the evaporator surface, you likewise maintain tight temperature control, even within a few degrees. Pump two-phase cooling offers higher heat flux capability than conventional pumped liquid systems. The, te the technology can also hand transient responses, as we'll see in a minute. And, although it is not a requirement, most P2P applications use refrigerant as the working fluid. They are generally dielectric materials, ensuring no component damage if there are leaks in the system. Additionally, pump two-phase systems can transfer heat over long distances from inside temperature-controlled rooms to an outside heat sink, for example. They can accommodate multiple evaporators within a single system. They are orientation independent, meaning they can work against gravity and they can be implemented to provide excellent thermal management over large areas. 1.8 square foot applications being recently demonstrated here at ACT. Here is a video demonstrating pump two-phase cooling with multiple evaporators. Flow from the bottom of the page to the top. Each evaporator is dissipating 300 watts when turned on. The four colored circles represent when each of the heat sources are on. When they are off, flow returns to the single phase regime. Notice particularly the blue and yellow dots, the first and third evaporators from the left which are cycled on and off pretty frequently. Also notice that no matter which or how many are turned off, all of those that are turned on are demonstrating the boiling associated with pump two-phase cooling. There's no sound in this video, so you must pay attention to the colored circles disappearing and reappearing. Okay, go ahead with the video. The rapid change from two-phase cooling to single-phase cooling, bubbles to no bubbles and then back again, is a pretty good demonstration of the flexibility of pump two-phase technology. Here is a pump two-phase application. Laser diodes typically require lots of power, most of which results in waste heat. Vertical cavities, surface emitting lasers, for example, can have heat fluxes in excess of 500 watts per centimeter squared. Further, the heat loads must be dissipated while maintaining a uniform temperature across the evaporator surface. In many cases, pump liquid systems are not suitable for these applications. It is difficult or impossible to meet the isothermality requirements of a few degrees C, particularly when hundreds of laser diodes are involved. In these applications, a pump two-phase cooling solution is often appropriate. One can see another example of a pump two-phase evaporator in the lower right. Flow is from left to right, and one can see the bubbles exiting the evaporator. The formation of the bubbles as the working fluid passes through the cold plate is confirmation that evaporation is occurring. Bubbling across the evaporator surface provides the high heat flux dissipation and temperature uniformity required for laser diode applications. Pump two-phase cooling offers the potential to address increasing heat dissipation requirements, 
up to 1,000 watts per centimeter squared by some estimates in which air and pump liquid systems would be weight and power challenge to accomplish. Pump two-phase systems require only a small pump and can be designed to be compact and lightweight. We reviewed three applications where P2P systems are being implemented today, including a laser diode cooling, which has very high heat flux requirements and a very tight temperature range. So we anticipate that there will be additional pump two-phase cooling applications. IGBTs and hybrid battery packs are two potential areas. Next, we'll move on to loop thermosiphons. A loop thermosiphon is a passive two-phase cooling device. It relies on gravity head to drive the liquid around the loop. You may be familiar with typical thermosiphons as shown here on the left. A typical thermosiphon has a pool of liquid at the bottom. When heat is added, it evaporates the liquid and the vapor naturally rises to the top of the pipe. When you remove that heat from the top of the pipe, the vapor condenses and liquid just falls back down by gravity. The liquid and vapor operate in the same space inside the pipe. A loop thermosiphon operates on the same principles, but here we separate the liquid and vapor flows in more of a loop fashion, as the name suggests. If you look on the right side image, we utilize the height of the liquid to drive the loop. The pressure head pushes liquid into the evaporator section, causing the liquid to boil in the evaporator. This creates voids inside of the flow. Those voids reduce the density of the fluid and that allows the liquid to displace the flow all the way around the loop. The two-phase mixture travels up to a condenser where the waste heat can be removed. The liquid condenses to its form and then falls into a liquid column to continue the loop. This technology can be used in a number of ways. It consists of an evaporator, a condenser, and just two liquid lines, one containing liquid and one containing vapor. As shown here, the configuration of the evaporator could be an aluminum plate where you mount your heat generating components like a typical liquid cold plate solution. The fluid evaporates and naturally rises to a tube fin type condenser. Air is blown across the condenser where it condenses the vapor into a liquid and it falls back down and continues to loop. And that's how a loop thermosiphon functions. And now we'll turn it back to Linda for our final polling question. Okay, thanks Pete. So our, our second question for our audience is, do you have a current need for thermal management solutions? And uh, Either A, yes, we have a need now, B, we foresee needing them in the next zero to six months, C, we foresee needing them in the next six to 12 months, or D, we don't have any current or foreseeable need. And again, we'll give you a couple seconds to enter your answer, and then uh, Pete, you can take it right back. Thank you, Linda. In a loop thermosiphon, the evaporator and condenser can take on many different forms. It could be a flat, flat plate. It could be a liquid-to-liquid -liquid heat exchanger, an air-to-air -air heat exchanger, whatever is necessary. The only requirement is that the condenser is physically above the evaporator, so you have gravity to work to your advantage. Different configurations of the loop thermosiphon have been built here at ACT. You can remotely mount the condenser as shown in the top right image. You can use flexible lines that gives the system designer a lot of flexibility in how you place the system. You can blow air from top to bottom or left to right. There's really an infinite number of ways you can configure these systems to fit your needs.
Here is some performance data. This is for a typical power electronics application where we're dissipating up to 10 kilowatts of heat. We're showing data for 7 kilowatts on the right. You can see the two-phase nature of the cold plate allows your temperature gradients to be reduced. You can maintain all of your modules mounted on one cold plate within 5 to 7 degrees C, even up to 10 kilowatts of heat. Here's an example of an application of a loop thermosiphon on a high-precision analytical machine. In this case, the instrument manufacturer had a high-precision device that required an expensive and cost-ineffective chiller to cool the kilowatt-level sensors. Coincidentally, and for other reasons, the machine also required facility air to operate the device. The customer wanted to explore if an air-cooled solution could be developed to replace the chiller. A loop thermosiphon was designed and built to replace the chiller. The loop thermosiphon solution matched the temperature performance of the chiller, exceeded the heat dissipation requirements, and reduced footprint and operating costs compared to the chiller. Loop thermosiphons are essentially passive thermal management devices that can move and dissipate kilowatt levels of heat. These gravity-aided devices can offer reduced cost and footprint solutions compared to conventional metal heat sinks and even some heat pipe heat sinks. As we have seen, they can be configured and implemented in many ways, offering flexibility for the design engineer. Common applications include IGBT cooling for medium voltage drive, high-powered precision instruments as we just have seen, or anywhere heat dissipation can occur above the heat source. Today, we review two high-performance thermal management technologies, pump two-phase cooling and loop thermosiphon. Each provides excellent thermal management solutions for selected applications. Both can dissipate high levels of heat and both take benefit from phase change for thermal management. Pump two-phase cooling offers a high heat dissipation with reduced space and tight temperature control. Pump two-phase cooling takes benefit of the latent heat of vaporization and is designed to have the working fluid move from a single phase to two phase as it passes across the heat source. Compared to the more conventional pump liquid system, P2P offers significant power and weight savings. Loop thermosiphon offer essentially passive heat transfer and can be deployed in a variety of configurations. It is finding many applications in power electronics especially cooling IGBTs. Each are different, but both provide excellent thermal management in selected applications. Thank you, and now we'll turn it back to Linda for some questions. Okay, thank you, Pete. Uh, and we do have a number of questions from our audience. Um, so, Pete, uh, you and Devin, um, here we go. What kinds of working fluids are used in a loop thermosiphon? Typically, the working fluids are dielectric fluids, meaning they don't conduct electricity. That makes them safe for most electronics applications, and it also allows us to utilize fluids that are commonly used in vapor compression systems, things like R134A, which can be found in automotive applications or HVAC applications across the world. So they're commonly used fluids. They're dielectric, and they have properties that allow us to easily boil and condense them around the loop so that we can efficiently utilize the two-phase heat transfer. Okay. Our next question is, what limits how much power a loop thermosiphon can handle? That's a good question. There's one main limit, and that's the amount of gravity head that you can provide. So the distance between the evaporator and the condenser is key for a loop thermosiphon. If you imagine a pumped liquid loop, you have your pump in the system that enables you to add pressure and force the liquid around the loop. In this case, for a loop thermosiphon, we just have gravity head. So we have a column of liquid and that's our pump. So you need to minimize the amount of pressure drop that's in the loop so you can maximize the amount of flow you can get for a given amount of height of liquid column. So the distance between the liquid uh, column and your evaporator section is, is key to getting maximum performance. Okay. 
um, are pumped to face cooling systems typically pressurized? And if so, what are typical values? Yes, they are. The refrigerants that are often inside of these systems have uh, vapor pressures around 70 PSI at room temperature, and they can operate up to about 60 degrees C. That would be a fluid temperature of 60 C, which results in a pressure inside the loop of around 250 PSI. So the systems must be designed to maintain pressure containment and to be hermetic uh, for long life operation. Okay, let's see. Our next question is, what advantages would a loop thermosiphon have over a heat pipe heat sink in a power electronics application? That's another good question. Loop thermosiphons can typically handle much more power than a heat pipe can. In the example we showed, the loop, a loop thermosiphon separates the liquid and the vapor flow, so you get more of a loop fashion. That allows you to move more fluid into the heated region than you would in a normal heat pipe. In order to do the same amount of power with heat pipes as you can with a loop thermosiphon, you'd need many pipes inside of your system, which can be cost prohibitive and a lot of times volume constraint prohibitive in a lot of applications. Okay. Uh, for loop thermosiphons, is there a maximum distance between the evaporator and the condenser? Not really, no. You're, the more you put the condenser away, or above actually, above the evaporator, the more flow you can generate inside of your loop. The maximum distance is really dependent on the amount of pressure drop that you have inside of your system. If you have high pressure drop in your system, you need much more distance between the evaporator and condenser vertically for gravity to drive the loop. Um, our next question, what kinds of working fluids are used in a pumped two-phase cooling solution? These fluids are very similar to the fluids we would use in a loop thermosiphon. They're often dielectric fluids, again, non-conductive fluids in the off chance that you have a leak in your system. They're low vapor pressure fluids so that if they were to evacuate the system, they would leave in a vapor phase and not pool anywhere. So there are often refrigerants, again, like R134A, that you can find in any HVAC system. So a lot of the same uh, fluids can be used for loop thermosiphons and pump two-phase. Pump two-phase systems just being the active version and higher performance. Okay. Why is using vapor so much better to remove heat than liquid? It's an interesting question. Actually, we're not using the vapor to remove the heat. We're using the liquid that is converting into vapor. So the liquid's removing the heat from the, from the evaporator section, and the vapor is the byproduct of that heat addition to the liquid. So the vapor naturally moves away to your condenser section, where you condense the vapor back to liquid form to return the loop. If you were to use just vapor for cooling, it would actually be quite poor, uh, much like using air to cool your system. Okay, and we have time for one more question. Does a loop thermosiphon need a wick structure? No, that's another big difference between loop thermosiphons and heat pipes. A heat pipe relies on capillary pumping. That's your pump in your system is a capillary structure, much like when you stick a paper towel into a glass of water and watch the water rise. A loop thermosiphon relies on gravity head, so a column of liquid. So it doesn't need any sort of capillary pump to move the liquid around the loop. You just have your column of liquid that displaces the vapor inside of your evaporator. Okay, great. Thanks, Devin. Uh, that will do it for all the time we have for questions. Uh, I would like to thank uh, our speaker, Pete Ritt, and thank Devin Pellicone, and all of our audience members for attending. Uh, just a reminder that this webcast will be available on demand for 12 months at www.techbriefs.com. Thanks again, and have a great day.